It was the title of Stephen Garrett's book that caught my eye. I was not familiar with his name before, but it struck me. Monks without a church life beyond religion. And it struck me because it seemed expressive of a kind of modern orientation that I think more and more people have that what you do is more important than what you believe or necessarily the building that you believe it in. So we'll get started with Stephen Garrett. Appreciate it. Thank you. Hello. Hello. My goodness, what an introduction. Monks without a church, life beyond religion. What the heck is that all about? You may be wondering what I'm crazy about. Unlike my friend Greg, who is crazy about skiing and doing two million vertical feet of up and down, or like Jill, who is crazy about going across an ocean, or Martin, who's crazy about marathons, man, that's not me. I've skied, I've sailed, and I've run marathons. What I'm really crazy about is the human spirit, the human heart. What is it that makes a man like Greg climb two million feet? What the heck is that? Or makes Jill row across the ocean? What is that power? What is that force? Or makes Martin run 250 marathons in a year? What is that driving energy, that excitement? Who is that inside the body? So for the last 13 years, I've taken people all over the world to look for that very thing. We've been to India and Peru and Egypt and Africa seeking that power, that force. Anybody know what I'm talking about? What is that that drives us? What is it? Well, I've discovered something very unusual as I've pondered and worked over life for the last 13 years. I've discovered that sometimes it's not the life that we're looking for. It's the one that's living it. I've also discovered something very unusual. I've spent a lot of time focusing on one half of the coin, life. Life, but what's the other half of life? What's the opposite to life? Death. Woo. I think we better be quiet about that one. <laughs> However, what I've discovered is that the more I embrace my life and my death, the more fully I live it. I was a hospice worker for generations. I worked with death and dying ongoingly. I quit not because I don't like death, but I was tired of the complaints I heard from people on their deathbeds. Oh, I wish I had. Oh, if only I had. Oh, I should have. Oh, I could have. Why didn't you? Because I thought I had time. I thought I had tomorrow. I thought I had next month. You see, most of us treat death as though it's something to get rid of, something to push away, something to, like an, a mortal enemy. I had a family member who was very ill with a heart condition. She had to go to a hospital to get fixed. So I went to the heart cardiac floor of the Vancouver General Hospital. And I was watching this whole thing going on around death. And the doctor did a great job, saved her life, and she's still alive. Thank goodness. God bless Roberta. But as I was in the hospital, I was watching the nurses. I was watching the doctors. I was watching the staff. I'm going, what's going on here? It was like a, it was like a war zone. So I went to the doctor after the operation. I said to him, hey, bro, thank you so much for saving my aunt's life. You did a remarkable job. And I saw the compliment going over in time and space that hit something and dropped to the floor. So that compliment didn't go in. I thought, that's odd. I mean, I'm just being genuine from my heart to his heart, giving him a compliment for a great job. He w I tried six or seven times on two different days. The compliment didn't go in. I thought, what's that all about? That's the most bizarre thing I've ever seen. Why wouldn't he receive the compliment? And then I got it. I went, oh my. If that doctor let the compliment in that he'd saved a life, he'd have to own its opposite, that he didn't save a life. And then the light went on in my head. I went, holy smokes. I started to look around the world. I started to do some research on death. It's not a very sexy topic, yet I will demonstrate to you at the end of this talk how sexy death is with two French words. 
All right, I guarantee it. And Moses will remind me if I don't. But I started, I started, to, I started to research death. And I started to get what's going on here. We're so death adverse. So I hopped onto the internet, which is a great way to go. It's much safer than climbing to thousands of feet in the air and rowing across the ocean. I start to recognize something going on here. Moses has created this magazine called Zoomer, which is a whole bunch of us guys progressing along the demographics. We're heading for the exit doors in a hurry. Now, it's gone quiet in here because I'm talking about death, but how inspiring could that be? We have a glorious opportunity here right now with Zoomers to change the way we look at death and to treat it as a friend and as an ally, as a little reminder on our shoulder that we have a life that we're living today. So I thought, what can I do to help people change the conversation about death so we embrace it more, so we don't try and push it away? How can we help people have a great death, as a doctor friend of mine said the other day, how can we help people have a great death? How can we do that? Because if we can help them have a great death, we can help them have a great life. So I started to look at the demographics. I started to look at like, this big block of people that are dying. And then I started to look at the hospice agencies in British Columbia. There are 55 only. And there's only 100 funeral homes. There's only a few hospitals, a few doctors, a few hospice volunteers. There's very few people out there. And the system we've got in place right now is handling only 23 or 24% of the hospice needs of the generation that's coming towards us. Do you know in 20 years, our death rate is going to more than triple? Holy cow, I thought, my God. How can we train enough hospice workers? How can we train enough doctors or nurses? We can't. All these structures we've built maybe need to be renovated just a little bit. Changed just a little bit. Get the idea, by the way. I used to work for social service agencies. I used to be a hospice worker. So this is not about the people, it's about the system. Get the idea that these social networks have, in a way, sucked out of community all these skills, all these abilities, and professionalized them, and rented them back to our people. Can you get that idea? We've kind of sucked them all out of community. What I think we need to do right here, right now, over the next 10 years is, get our hands on top of these social service silos and start to push and push and push and drive the skills, drive the compassion, drive the abilities, drive the knowledge back down into committee where it came from so that we can handle our people in a more loving, graceful, compassionate way. Does that sound like a great idea? Listen, the reason I'm here right now is I had a sister die on May the 5th, 1988 at 632. I used to be a stockbroker here in downtown Toronto. I worked for Burns Fry Company. I was in the investment business. I was making a whole lot of money I thought I had forever. My sister died without knowing how much I loved her. Oh, God, what a mistake that was. The day I put her into the grave, into the ground, I made a commitment to her. I'm going to find out what the heck's going on here. And what I found out is... It's great to create a life to die for. It's also brilliant to create a death to live for. I was in Bali last uh, August, and uh, we did some touring around with a bunch of people, and uh, our guide said, hey, come and see a cremation. And the group went, uh, don't think so. <laughs> but I thought, well, let's go and see the cremation. What the heck, what can I do? I'm in Bali, it's great anyways. I'll get a suntan, what the heck? So we went to this cremation, and when we first arrived, I thought, What's going on here? We must be in the wrong address. There's a party going on here. They had a parade and they had all kinds of people singing and dancing. There was food and barbecues and liquor and it was a celebration. It was a celebration of a life well lived. And I went, oh my God, this is what I'm looking for. This is what my heart is aching for in my country. I came back home and I noticed that we don't do that very much at funerals here. When my father died back in 2004, I had this thing about, let's celebrate Lloyd's life. So I brought his golf clubs to the church. I brought his bottle of Jack Daniels. I bought his, you know, his cribbage board and his cribbage cards. And I'm, let's celebrate Lloyd's life. I'm in this place of, yeah! And people are going, well, wait a minute. 
You know, your dad's dead. How dare you celebrate? I wasn't celebrating his death, for goodness sakes. I was celebrating the life well lived. And this is something I think I'm, if I leave you with anything today at all, it's let's start to look at death in a different way. I got a job description given to me about eight months ago from God, if you want to refer to it as that. I'm standing around, I've been doing you know, personal growth work for 13 years, and all of a sudden I get this urge in my heart. It's time to change the conversation about death. <laughs> Are you talking to me? Yep. It's time to change the conversation about death in Canada. Holy shit. What? Me? I'm not smart enough. I don't have a degree in any of that kind of stuff. It's your job. Stop complaining. Do it. <laughs> so, I took on this job to help my country change the conversation it has about death from denial to embrace. My next book coming out is called Embracing Your Death, A New Lease on Life. Because it's time for us to start to live much more fully. And I'll tell you something. I don't know what the heck's going to happen tomorrow. I might walk out of this studio today and get killed by a car. I'll be dead. Did I give my fullest to you all today? Or did I hold a little bit back in reserve for tomorrow? Does that make sense? So my job is to change the conversation of death in Canada. And I said, how the hell am I going to do that? I'm one guy and there's 35 million of us. And I thought, Zoomer magazine. Okay. So I, I wrote a letter to Moses. I said, I said some crazy stuff in here. I said, you know, in researching our preparedness for this wave of death, Several ideas have come to mind. Change the conversation about death from denial and avoidance to one of acceptance and embrace. And return the skills and capacity to deal with death as a natural event to the community it came from. And then I said to him, what would it take for me to make this happen? Well, it took this. <laughs> he invited me to come down here and present to help change the conversation around death in our country, so that we can actually have some fun with it and we can take it as a champion, we can take death as an ally, we can take it as a friend, we can use it as an inspiration. You get that? If you really get that you're going to be dead, and you are, because nobody in this planet has ever gotten out of here alive, it's one common thing we all have, birth and death, right? If you can embrace the fact that we are going to die, Wow, it gives you so much juice to live because you just don't know. Oh, I'll handle it tomorrow. I'll tell my friend that I've just met what a great guy he is and how handsome he is. I'll do that tomorrow. Well, tell Greg how inspired I was by his journeys. I'll do that tomorrow. Oh, I'll phone my mom tomorrow. Oh, I'll hug my wife more deeply tomorrow. Oh, man. I've got death sitting right in my shoulder. I love death. I'm crazy about death. It's the coolest thing in the world because you know what I get the moment I embrace my death? I get life. Full, glorious, passionate, juicy, sexy life. It's remarkable. So I'm going to encourage us all. I mean, when I, when I started about this, this, this whole topic about death, I've got this email address, embracing your death. My mother goes, oh, Stephen, that's a little much. I'm getting a website done. I want to put death on it. And my web designer says, oh, you can't say death. What? We have to be able to talk about it in a real way, with joy, with acceptance, with love. And yeah, you know what? I miss my dad. I really miss him. He was a great guy, Lloyd. I'm really missing him because I was just getting my cribbage money back that he took from me when I was a teenager. <laughs> you know, he was going blind and he had those big cards, you know? So I'm pissed I can't get my money back, but gosh. You know, in the moment of his death, he phoned me one day. He said, son, I'm lying in a hospital bed. I got tubes in every hole in my body. I can't play cribbage. I can't go golfing. I can't drink Jack Daniels. This is not loving kindness. So my dad and I had a talk about his death. In that conversation about his very death, I got how deeply my father loved me. And he got how deeply his son loved him. Oh, boy. The history vanished. There was just me and my father deeply in love, and we were talking about something that we shouldn't talk about, which is death. 
So I invite you all in a way, I mean, there's 35 million people here in Canada. I'm one guy. I'd like to anoint you all death ambassadors. <laughs> Boom, it's, all, all, it's already done. Let's really try and hold death in the way it ought to be hold. It's a sacred event, no different than birth. It's a glorious reminder of how important it is to climb a mountain because you want to, to row an ocean because you want to, to run 250 marathons because you want to, because it's who you are. There's no time like the present to really get in touch with your heart. This is what I'm good at, by the way. If anybody wants to get in touch with your heart, phone me. Check out my website. I'll help you get in touch with your heart and see what's living there and see what needs to be spoken or written or danced or rode or climbed before you die. One of the biggest things I found about people who are dying is the regret that they didn't live their deepest heart in life. I don't want anybody in this room to have any regrets. If you want to play drums, play drums. If you want to run naked through the streets of Toronto, run naked and take your flip cam. It might make you a lot of money. <laughs> but please take death as an ally, as a friend, as something to embrace, as a motivator. It'll change your life dramatically. It'll move you to tears of joy, not tears of grief. So I promised you that I would tell you how death is sexy. So English is kind of like a crass language in a way. The word orgasm. I mean, that doesn't even sound like attractive, except it brings up all these thoughts and ideas in the body, right? In French, the word for orgasm is petit mort. Petit mort. It's a little bit more sexy. Little death. Little death. So we were all born with a little death. You get it? Now, isn't that sexy? <laughs> so, yeah. So, I've got 29, 27, 26, 25, 24, 23, 22 seconds. Thank you so much for listening to a topic that we need to talk about as a people, as families, and as individuals. Please remember that title of the book, Embracing Your Death, is coming out in December. And I thank Moses for inviting me here and his amazing staff and volunteers for taking such good care of myself and my beautiful wife. Thank you. Well done. We'll see each other more often. Thanks.